Hey guys, welcome to the shop. I've been doing a ton of work on this old 1985 Chevy half ton pickup to get it ready for paint. And I want to share with you some of the stuff that I've been doing to, to get to the point that I'm at. Share with you some tips and tricks maybe that's been taught to me over the years of how to do body work on an old beat up vehicle and do it as fast as possible and get the best job possible because it is a monumental task to get something that's been used as hard as this old pickup truck back into shape and slick. And if we're lucky, if we're real lucky, we'll even, you know, shoot some primer, maybe? I don't know, probably not, but we'll try. Thanks for watching. Let me show you what's going on. So here's a look at the passenger side door that's gonna be going on this truck. It was really beat up real bad. This thing had been caved in by my daughter's pony years ago. I'd pushed the dents out and it was, little rust in the bottom seam you know the typical rust hole right here at the handle that i had to weld up a lot of work two days of work actually in this door to get it in the shape that it's in and it literally has filler from the bottom to the top but it in most places is no thicker than a than a sheet of notebook paper and i know that filler gets a bad it gets a bad name and it's not really it's not deserved filler that's used properly and that's applied to properly treated sheet metal will last and work you know excellent from now on in fact it'll probably last this uh, polyethylene filler will probably last longer than the metal that's under it if uh, if truth be known so that's what it takes in order to get an old beat up farm truck door straight again wipe the whole surface literally with filler and block sand it down as one sometimes it takes two three coatings but you know take finding the high spots that you didn't know existed knocking them down and sanding again that's that's what it took in order to get this passenger door straight again oh, man these wasps don't like me So just washing this hood off, get all the I mean, sap and pollen and goo and oil, everything off of here before I start sanding on this, just because you'll just push that down and your any coatings you put on won't, won't apply or won't adhere well. Plus getting a pan of wet like this, you know, when they're old and dingy, you can't see if they've got dents in them or not. But if you put some water on them, get, get some shine on it, like a new paint job will be, yeah, I mean, you can really see if there's you know, any damage. And this hood's definitely got some, but it's not all that bad. We had a couple, a couple good dents right there, one right there, and then I think there's some body filler right up there. But all in all, this hood's not rusty, and I think it'll, it'll be good. So while DA in this thing down, I found some previous damage that had been repaired and really they had done a decent job on it. It wasn't like a, sticking out like a sore thumb or anything before. We've got a low spot or a high spot here and here and low spots in a couple of places. Even got a weak spot where it's been stretched. So something's happened here. It almost looks like, you know, like somebody's been thrown up on the hood. Maybe they hit somebody? Who knows? Two brothers fighting in the driveway over who's going to feed the chickens? I have no idea. But it is damaged. And that'll have to be repaired. Probably wipe an area about like that. Wipe it down. We've got two good body lines here to hide our filler. And then a big 2K primer, right? Heavy, high build, block it, boom. Done.
So I don't always follow my own advice, but if I can give anybody else some advice to follow. If you're working on an old beat-up pickup truck like I am, old beat-up, classic car, whatever, just go ahead and wipe the entire panel. You can guarantee if it's been used that it's going to be beat from one end to the other, and if slick is what you're after, as far as the paint job goes anyway, it's going to it's gonna take it, because these trucks weren't slick from the factory. They were just a stamped sheet metal body that had minimal to no body work in most places, and sheet metal after 30 years, you know, being getting hail damage and cats running around on it and chicken fights, who knows, on the hoods. It just requires it. So go ahead, save yourself some time and some grief. Wipe the whole thing. So we've got a couple of dents here, a couple of small ones that will work on the back of the cab here, and I'll show you my, my process of repairing those. And I've got a few little tips and tricks that I've learned and been taught along the way that just speed things up and, and give you a better, better end result. Now, you can look over a vehicle, an old vehicle, and you may not see these dents, but you break out the block, the sanding block, and you start blocking stuff down, and these dents just start sticking out like a sore thumb. They start showing up everywhere. And, uh, you know, I'll show you the process of fixing those and a little bit of advice. If you're going to buy sandpaper, and if you're going to do something like this, you're going to buy sandpaper. You'll probably buy quite a bit of it. Buy the good stuff. Do not waste your time with that cheap sandpaper that stays sharp for like three seconds, and then you work yourself to death not realizing you're having to work harder than what you would had you just bought good quality sandpaper that stays sharp. This is 3M Gold. Now... As far as grits, I know people get confused on what type of sandpaper to buy. If you're doing just rough body filler work, like what I'm doing here, what I'll show you, 80 grit and 40 grit. 40 grit to start off with on your really, you just wiped your panel with body filler and you just want to knock it down to where it gets close to your shape that you want, it'll save you time. And then 80 grit, it cuts well. And if you're using a good polyethylene, high build primer it'll fill those 80 grit scratches and you won't have to have a million different sandpapers in order to get your body work nice and squared away coarser sharp sandpaper you'll get your body work flatter than what you will with fine stuff we're not trying to pot polish body filler we want it flat so let's work these couple of dents here and then uh, we'll move on maybe remove the windshield so on this pillar looks like we've got one two and three dents just a stiff block with some 80 grit. Just holding it flat. And that will highlight the high spots and the low spots. So we're going to have to work this whole area and this area here because we've got a dent there. So this truck has two paint jobs. One when it was new, obviously, and then it has a respray on it. So there's multiple layers of paint here that have to come off in order for me not to build up a, you know, a ton of layers of paint and get a good quality paint job. Now the act of spraying paint, usually the guy who sprays the car, you know, unless he did all the body work, he gets all the credit if it comes out super nice. But in my opinion, what makes a super nice paint job is how nice the body work is under that paint job. If you've got a nice slick surface that doesn't have a lot of wave in it, man, it just makes paint look, quality paint look really good. So that's the trick to getting a nice paint job is what's under the paint, not necessarily just the act of painting a vehicle. So I've got a lot of layers of paint here that have to be removed. So you wanna sand down in the bottoms here, dents really well. Make sure to get all of that old oxidized paint off. If your paint looks chalky and it's breaking down from the sun, it's got to come off. Doesn't necessarily all have to come off, but you need to get down to a good uh, stable base, right?
So I have got a completely bizarre and off-topic story for you. Something that happened to me a few months ago out here in the shop working. And I want in the comments you to tell me what you think it was. I was out here working. It was pitch, pitch dark. A couple months ago it was winter, basically. It was cold outside. Had the doors closed, right? Just out here doing the thing. And I hear the deepest animal noise that shook my insides. And it sounded like there was a silverback gorilla standing right outside of the front doors of this shop calling. Like, hoo, 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 hee, hee, hee. you know the noise. I don't have to 100% accurately recreate it. So, so loud this noise was that it shook my insides. And this was 100% an animal. It sounded just like what you would hear at the zoo. Now, keep in mind, I'm a skeptic when it comes to Bigfoot and stuff like that. You know, I'm a kind of a show me type of guy. Not saying it doesn't exist, but I, you know, I'd bet it. I'd bet against it if I was betting. Never seen a, anything like that. But anyway, and as soon as that noise got done, whatever the animal was making, I hear another one up on this hillside that sounded like to me that it answered it or what they were communicating or whatever. Strange, right? I will put down my tools. I walk over to the door. I grab them and I slide the doors open. And I look outside, grab my flashlight. Nothing. Fully expecting to see a silverback gorilla out in my driveway. Now I've heard all sorts of animal noises in my life. I've lived in the woods of central Kentucky my entire life. I've never heard anything even remotely close to this. We don't have bear, not in my area. We don't have elk in my area. We've got deer. We've got foxes, coyotes, raccoons, possums, squirrels, you name it, small critters. But whatever made this noise, because of how much bass that it had, how deep the noise was, it had to be big. So, you tell me, what made the absolutely gorilla-like noise out in my driveway a couple months ago? There's no zoos or anything around here close, you know, that, that one could have escaped from. And there was more than one, because I heard another one, whatever it was, answer the first noise. And it, there was not time in between the first noise and the second one for it to get, have gotten you know, you can tell the direction of noise. But don't know. Tell me what in the comments was it. You know, it was, whatever it was, it got me spooked. And I have no idea what made it. Grab that wheel and pull it. Push it. Pull it that way. Push it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, love. So a little bit of filler. Probably good enough on the harder. You want to mix this stuff till it's one consistent color. That's pretty blue. It's gonna get hard quick. rain of course it is as soon as I pulled this outside
always want to put on more than you need. You always sand it off. And it's a lot easier just to take care of it the first wipe. Then to keep going back and forth to the to the filler pad. Different what? It's why the color. That just depends on how much hardener I put in. So we got a dent here, and although it's only about the size of a quarter, really, the whole affected area is probably three times that size. Now I'm not trying to get the bodywork perfect on the on the back of the cab here. It's just a waste of time. But I do want, you know, if I somebody looks back here, they, they don't see a big dent. We're just gonna... The backs of these cabs were never done well anyway. Not even from the factory. They weren't straight. So we're gonna follow in their footsteps and just make it good enough. So I didn't put quite enough filler in this area right here. We're still going to have a dent there. But I've always found it easiest to sand this stuff just as soon as you can almost. And it just sands off so much faster. Candy girl. So if you have to do two wipes, if you know for sure, I would sand this quite a bit more and refine this, but I'm gonna wait because I know I gotta put more filler on here. You don't wanna sand this down perfect and have a low spot here, add filler to it, and then have to sand that spot. Because what you'll do is you'll also, not meaning, you will sand some of the area around it and make your, what was perfect sur surface other than your dent, not perfect. So, if you know you're going to have to wipe again, don't sand your surface any more than you have to before you wipe it. You also want to blow your surface off. Get all the dust off of it before you wipe filler on top of it again. Man, this stuff. Is blue, blue, blue. up and skim that because I'll sand it down too far if I don't. Now 
Boom. Little spot there, 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 and there. Just we'll just touch that with a little filler. And bring that into shape. And we got it. Alright, so that post turned out really nice. And the reason why I blew this off like I did really close high pressure is because it exposes all the little pinholes and if anything's going to show through paint or primer it'll be those little pinholes so we need to fill all these i'll show you how i do that super quick and then this will be done pretty much it turned out really good is that going to focus no is that the color All right, so hopefully you can see those pinholes there. So those will definitely show through the through the primer and paint if we didn't do anything. So we need to fill those, and I'll show you how I do that super quick. And this is done. Since we got the glazing putty, we might as well use a little bit of it. You can do the same thing with body filler. This stuff's just a little thinner, and it tends to, I don't know if it sands easier or not, but it's not difficult to sand and usually won't cause you to mess up the bodywork that you're wiping it on. Just a little bit of filler or a little bit of hardener. Boop. Plenty. Probably way too much. Now let's go mix this up and wipe it on. A little on the on the uh, spatula. And I just wipe it really hard one way. I'm pressing hard. I'm trying to force this stuff down into the pinholes and then I wipe it the other way. And that is pretty much the name of the game. That's the way I do it anyway. Got to make sure to wipe it in a couple directions or it, it won't really stick in those pinholes real great. Is it setting up already? You can use this stuff as as filler as well. You got a really little dent. But you're really just wasting it. Because body filler does just a good a job. And that's it. And now I'll just take a little paper and sand that off once it's dry. And it should be pinhole free. So when I met Elizabeth, I was working at a body shop. She likes the smell of body filler. She says they should make a clone that smells like that. Luckily, I've been wearing it for, you know, two weeks now. So she likes that. Um, I worked for my brother for probably... he. Ran a body shop for probably about three years, and then I worked at a commercial, you know, big place in town for a few years as well. Done quite a bit of it in my life. Not my most favorite thing to do, but it's not horrible. There's stuff I would rather not do than this. So I'm going to shoot a little primer on these doors out here, and I'm using uh, Evercoat Super Build 4-1. This is basically, it's not spray Bondo, but it's about as close as you're going to get to spray Bondo. And anywhere where you're using, we've got a lot of body work going on, you know, this stuff's good because you can, you know, it gives you a really thick layer that you can block sand out and get really flat. This is my first time uh, ever spraying this stuff using a 1.8 
tip. There we go. So I don't know that the 1.8 tip will actually spray this stuff very well because it's so thick, but I'm gonna try. I've got my catalyst mixed in, gun's clean. We're just gonna try to mix this stuff up pretty good. We don't have a lot of time. I'm using the fast set hardener, a little cool today, the fast catalyst. So we'll see. Kind of an experimental run, really, more than anything. See how this stuff acts. So we don't have any clumps or chunks. Stirring up a can of this stuff after it's set. Not, not easy. enough. All right. Outside. Yeah, I'll go over it probably twice. Depends. 90% of this will get sanded off. Oh, uh, I'm out. All right. That's it. So there we go. The primer is on the doors and on my little front valance. I shot that as, as well. We use the DeVelvis starting line. This is a uh, HVLP with a 1.8 mil tip. And that is the smallest tip that they recommend spraying this stuff with. And I see why, because it really really went on slow. It really could have used more product coming out of here and I had it wide open. So I would spray this stuff with a bigger tip, right, if you have the option to do so. Now, this is a four to one mix ratio, which means you know, four parts product, one part catalyst. Super simple to mix and I use the fast set catalyst they offer too, because it's pretty cool today, below 70 degrees, it's in the 60s. And I wanted this, my parts to set up as quick as possible simply because the quicker they dry, the less bugs and stuff is going to fly in it because, you know, I'm doing this stuff outside. So this stuff is very similar, I believe, to the Slick Sand, the Featherfield G2. I think it's all pretty much a similar product. I'm interested to see how it sands. I've heard that it's hard to sand. 
this is your last chance, right? This is a building product. We're still in the shaping stages of those doors. Spray this on, give me a good build up. I'll block it down. It'll seal in all that body work and keep it all, all nice and sealed up and give me enough product to you know, get that final crisp shape that I want. And I'm hoping that it turns out nice. You can spray this direct to metal as well. Properly sanded metal, that is. You don't want to spray it on rust, but you get the idea. Worked out pretty good. Like glue, really. So I literally just sprayed this five minutes ago, and I can already touch it. I've got some stuff falling out of the trees in it, but you know this is primer, not paint. It's going to be sanded. It didn't go down quite as smooth as what I would like, but it looks good. And after we put the sandpaper to it, it won't make a bit of difference anyway. So hopefully this shows you, if you're using a product that's catalyzed like mine, you're spraying on a warm day, you could literally do this out, out in your driveway. You can get your vehicle in primer. Painting's a different story, right? You don't have to be Mozart, Mozart, Picasso to spray down primer. Main thing, get your surface prepped properly, blow it off really good so it adheres and try to put it on you know, as evenly as possible. So there you go, two coats on the hood, Two coats again on the doors. Glad to have it on the hood, right? If you're a weekend warrior like me, yeah, this doesn't happen all in one day, really. So you got to get your stuff sanded and protected because it may be a while before you get back to it. So, there you go. Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. So I want to show you a little trick to removing these windshields, hopefully without breaking it, by yourself. And once you learn this, it's it's just obvious that this is the way that you would do it. But it's it's not something you may think of right off the bat. So I want to share that with you. Now this truck is no different than all the other hundreds of thousands of these things that were ever made. It leaks around the windshield. Most of them did. And I think that's what's, what caused my passenger side floorboard to become transparent and need replaced is because the windshield leaks. I've got a little rust in the bottom seam. And in order to work that properly, I need to pull the windshield. I wasn't gonna do it, but now I am. Why not? I'm here. And this cab is just about ready for primer, so I wanna, you know, keep pushing. So, if you're gonna replace one of these windshields, just count on replacing the rubber gasket as well, because it's what will cause you to break these every time getting them out. So let me show you how to get these out without breaking the windshield, hopefully. So these windshields are pretty tough to get out without breaking. I remember my brother pulling one of these out and he tried to save the gasket and he broke the windshield. And then, you know, you could hear him five miles away with the you know, fancy words that he used because of it. And really all that would have needed done is just to sacrifice the gasket. Consider it a consumable because it is you don't want to reuse one of these old gaskets anyway they're pretty cheap the easiest way go around this thing after you've pulled out the locking strip is go around this thing with a razor blade cutting that locking lip off and then we should be able to hopefully just push this thing out Ugh. all right razor knife and what I'm gonna do is just go up under this lip of this gasket and just cut it all the way down to where I'm just rubbing the side of the glass lightly until we get all the way around this windshield. Don't you dare break on me. And then it should just push right out. go now we should be able to just push it out <clears throat> that easy now what I'm gonna do is take this little plastic tool and because I can I can go around the inside and just break the because it's stuck right it's gonna be just gonna take this tool and just kind of work it I'm not prying I'm just kind of going around the glass 
between the glass and the gasket. I'm trying to release it a little bit. Definitely got it good and loose at the bottom. You can imagine this is just not going to happen with that lock and lip and stuff on it without, without breaking them. And after years, they just get kind of stuck to that rubber gasket. Maybe they used a little urethane, you know, maybe they didn't. But I guess it matters after all that time. Just sticky gasket and brittle glass, you know. Not a good recipe. Still kind of stuck in this corner. bit of coaxing. We got it. There we go. Glass is out. And I didn't break it. Yet. Boom. So even though they're a lot easier to get out like that, you know, cutting that extra lip off of them, they're still Pretty stuck after 35 years to that old old gasket so you know this is the reason why this windshield needed pulled out and probably why you should pull a windshield out of any one of these that you do they get a little crusty water seeping in there over years getting behind that gasket and you know then it just keeps leaking in your floorboards and before you know it you've got a rotted out window seal and rotted out floorboards. Right now this is this is easy enough to fix, but you know, five or more years down the road, probably not. So yes, we do have some rust, which I knew what we did, and I'm glad I pulled that out because it's a lot worse. It always is. Rust is always worse than the what little bit you can see. But on both sides and the corners it has rust, but it's easily repairable. So I'm glad that I pulled that out. You know when I did because I got to fix the leak anyway so why not you know pull it out and do it right con this far and now I can do the rest of the body work on the cab the roof is already done other than primer I can tape this thing up pull it outside shoot the primer on it block it out and this thing will be you know ready ready for color right or getting close anyway now I want to say a massive thank you I don't do this near enough and and 
I want to take a minute to just say thank you to anyone who's helped me out whatsoever with either the shop, which I've had a ton of help with, and I have not forgotten that, and for all the people who sent me you know, a few parts and pieces for the truck. Much appreciated. Picked it up off the Amazon wish list. You know, I'm just amazed at all of the support that I've got and humbled, and I appreciate it. Just want to say thank you. If I haven't told you thank you personally, this is it. Thank you very much. Now, I have a request, and I don't ask for... I don't ask my viewers to search for parts and stuff for me ever, really. But I am going to right now. If you can find a 1979 through 1987 short bed Chevrolet bed <laughs> for with this thing, I would love to get one that's in good shape, that's not beat all the pieces and rusted to death like mine is. Or, let's say you've got a couple bedsides for a short bed Chevy in those years that you ended up not using. You know, you bought them a while back, you didn't use them. Let me know, because I'd be interested in buying them from you. And if they're anywhere lo relatively local, you know, that's in a dr decent driving distance, I'll drive and pick them up, gladly pay you for them. I just can't get them. Parts hard to get right now, and bedsides are something that's just not available at the moment. And if you have some, or know where a bed is at, that would save me a ton of body work, you know, on, on this bed out here, which I may fix, you know, just because, we'll see. But you get the idea. Let me know. Thanks. Send me an email. I would really appreciate it. So, I guess that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever. Get out of my face, bug mosquitoes. They're out now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.